All right, judges, please. And the first chapter, I want to read the first eight verses. Uh, we're going to largely spend our time considering an introduction to the book. So we, we may not even get to these verses, but anyway, let's just read them. It says, now after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord saying, who shall go up for us against the Canaanites first to fight against them? And the Lord said, uh, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have delivered the land into his hand. And Judah said unto Simeon, his brother, come up with me into my lot, that we may fight against the Canaanites, and I likewise will go with thee into thy lot. So Simeon went with him. And Judah went up, and the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand, and they slew of them in Bezek ten thousand men. And they found Adonai Bezek in Bezek, and they fought against him. And they slew the Canaanites and the Perizzites. But Adonai Bezek fled, and they pursued after him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and his great toes. And Adonai Bezek said, Three score and ten kings, having their thumbs and their great toes cut off, gathered their meat under my table, as I have done. So God hath requited me. And they brought him to Jerusalem, and there he died. Now the children of Judah had fought against Jerusalem and had taken it and had smitten it with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. And again, God will bless the reading of his precious word to us this morning. So by way of introduction to the book of Judges, I want to actually go back to Joshua. And Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15, uh, very familiar words it says uh, in verse 15, it says, And it, if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, and whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So he gives the people a choice. Who are you going to serve? Are you going to serve uh, the Lord, or are you going to serve the gods of the Amorites? And they respond, and it's a good response. In verse 24, it says, The people said to Joshua, The Lord our God will we serve, and his voice will we obey. So they made a very definite commitment to serve the Lord and to obey his voice. But when we get to the book of Judges, we find that they failed to live up to their words. And sadly, many of them made wrong choices. Lots of them uh, ended up uh, going after the gods of the Canaanites. And the consequences for them individually and for the nation nationally were absolutely catastrophic. And so we, we see that in many ways, this is a book of a departure, a book of declension, a book of failure, and uh, it could be quite discouraging, apart from the fact that God in his mercy, when they were brought low, they cried out to him, and he raised up deliverers, and there were pockets of blessing and revival when these men were raised up, and one woman. So we'll think about that as we go through. But uh, there's different reasons as to why the book of Judges is the way it is. Some have suggested that it's a lack of clear leadership, uh, because certainly in the past you've had strong leadership. You've had Moses, and you've had Joshua, who have led the people. And after, of course, the passing of Joshua, uh, there's no clear leader that emerges amongst the people. Uh, no person to follow on, as it were, from Joshua. And one of the statements that we're going to observe uh, in the book of Judges that's repeated, and if you look with me to Judges chapter 17, you're going to see a repetition of this phrase. It says in verse 6 of chapter 17, In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. If you look at chapter 18 and verse 1, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel, 
if you look at chapter 19 and verse 1. And it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel. And then if you look at chapter 21 in the very last verse of the book of Judges, it says in those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Because it leads to the question, uh, who should have been king in Israel? Who should have been the one that was reigning uh, during this period? And of course, the answer is given by one of the judges, by perhaps one of the most successful judges, that being Gideon. And if you look at Judges chapter 8, verse 23, Judges 8, 23, it tells us who really should have been ruling at that time. It says, and Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. So <laughs> basically, the people should have been in full submission to the Lord. And if they had have been, it would have been a different history in a different story. And of course, the practical application is very evident to us. If, if we fail to live out the practical lordship of Christ, what is the result of that? Well, the result is that every man does that which is right in his own eyes. If we're not doing what's right in the eyes of the Lord, if we're not living out daily the practical lordship of Christ, we end up doing that which is right in our own eyes. And the result is the sad chaos that's evidenced in the book of Judges. And we can see it in our cultures today, can't we? We can see it in, in the North American continent, that uh, when people have rejected uh, the lordship of Christ uh, on a whole scale level, what is the end result of that? Well, the end result is every man does that which is right in his own eyes. And it's terrible. It's chaotic. It's, uh, it's, it's awful. It's like the book of Judges. We kind of, in many ways, I guess we feel like we're living in similar days. So we want to ask the question, who is the author of this book? And of course, we're not told in the text itself but Hebrew tradition, uh, and the, particularly the Talmud, maintain that this book was the work of none other than Samuel. And it was written during the early days of the monarchy uh, when Saul was the king. The Talmud says that he wrote Judges, he wrote Ruth, and he was also the author, as we know, of First Samuel. And so it was written during the early days of the monarchy after the coronation of Saul, which was 1051 BC, but before the conquest of Jerusalem by David in 1004 BC. So it was written somewhere between 51, 1051 BC, 1004 BC. Where do we get that from? Well, uh, I think the reason that that is the assumed time frame of when this was written is based on this phrase that we've already looked at. Uh, in those days, there was no king in Israel. We have just saw it said again and again and again. But obviously, when this book is being written, there is a king in Israel. Okay, In other words, it's right in looking back and saying, during this period, the period of the judges, there was no king in Israel. The implication is there is one now. So it's clearly written in the early days of the monarchy. But it's not written during uh, David's reign. And we know that because uh, there's a statement in chapter 1, verse 21, uh, and it says this. It says, the children of, Bez of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites that inhabited Jerusalem, but the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem unto this day. So when this book of Judges is being written, the Jebusites are still in Jerusalem. They haven't been driven out up to this very day, he says. And so when you look at 2 Samuel, you will find in chapter 5, 2 Samuel chapter 5, that the Jebusites are driven out. In verse 6, it says, and the king and his men went to Jerusalem unto the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, 
which spake unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come in hither, thinking David cannot come in hither. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. The same is the city of David. And so <clears throat> clearly this book of Judges is written prior to David's reign and David expelling the Jebusites from Jerusalem, clearly written prior to that, uh, and written yet in a time where there is a king in Israel, uh, but looking back to a time when there was no king in Israel. One further indication about the correctness of this assumption, of that's when the book was written, is seen in chapter 1, verse 29, where it says, neither did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites that dwelt in Giza, but the Canaanites dwelt in Giza among them. And so Giza was still inhabited by the Canaanites. And we know from 1 Kings and chapter 9 and verse 16 that Pharaoh gave Giza to Solomon as a wedding present when he married Pharaoh's daughter. Chapter 9, verse 16, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, had gone up and taken Giza and burnt it with fire and slain the Canaanites that dwelt in the city and had given it for a present to his daughter, Solomon's wife. So basically what we're saying is this time frame that when it's written, it's the early days of the monarchy. There now is a king in Israel. It's looking back to a time when there was no king in Israel. The Jebusites are still in Jerusalem. So it's prior to David doing that. Giza is still in the hands of the Canaanites. It's prior to Pharaoh's conquest and giving it as a gift uh, to his daughter uh, on the marriage of uh, his daughter to Solomon. So that gives us the time frame. Uh, the Talmud gives us the authorship. Now the big question is, what is the key idea in the book? The key idea in the book of Judges, and it's a very important one. And the key idea, I believe, in the book of Judges is the devastating effects of failing to make progress. It's, it's the root of all their departure from God is their failure to make progress. Now, let's just, again, look at chapter one and point out this failure on their part. Notice, for instance, verse 19. It says, the Lord was with Judah and he drave out the inhabitants of the mountains, but could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley because they had chariots of iron. Verse 21, and the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites that inhabited Jerusalem. Verse 27, neither did Manasseh drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shan and her towns, the Atanak and her towns. Verse 28, it came to pass when Israel was strong that they put the Canaanites to tribute and did not utterly drive them out. Verse 29, neither did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites that dwelt in Giza. Verse 30, neither did Zebulun drive out the inhabitants of Kitron. Uh, verse 31, neither did Asher drive out the inhabitants of Akko. Uh, verse 32, but the Asherites dwelt among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out. Verse 33, neither did Naphtali drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh. Verse 34, and the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountains, for they would suffer, not suffer them to come down in the valley. And so really, it's a, it's a story of failure, failure to go on and make progress. If they had built on the progress made in the days of Joshua, it would have been a different story. And again, there's a lot of practicality to the book of Judges. I think as we go through, we're going to see it. It really has a lot of practical application because we, we need to ask ourselves too, are we making progress in the Christian life? Uh, there are three possibilities, and we've looked at this previously, I think, in other studies, but it's important to just review these things. Three possibilities. We're either pressing on, we're growing in grace and the knowledge of the Savior. Uh, we are moving, we're not static. We're moving on with the Lord. 
The second option is we're stagnant. There's no growth. We're just standing still. We're kind of treading water, so to speak, spiritually. And the third option is we're going backwards. And usually, if we're not pressing on, even if we're stagnant, stagnation ultimately doesn't last long. And we eventually begin to go backwards. I've often said Christian life is like riding a push bike uphill. If you stop pedaling, you don't stay static for long. You begin to roll backwards. And so that certainly is evident in the book of Judges. They did not press on after the days of Joshua and breaking the back of the Canaanite uh, nations. Uh, they should have then expelled them from all of their territories. They failed to do that. And the consequences are very evident throughout this book. There's also what some have pointed out as the third generation syndrome that really affects uh, the book of Judges. And I want you just to look at chapter two with me for a moment in verses seven through 11, where we get this third generation uh, syndrome described to us. It says, verse seven, and the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. So first generation did well, the second generation did well. And then we notice it says, Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord died, being 110 years old, and they buried him in the border of his inheritance, Timnath Heras, in the Mount of Ephraim, in the north side of the hill, Geash. And also that generation were gathered to their fathers. Okay, so the second generation gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And so this, this third generation is really who we're dealing with primarily in the book of Judges. The people who served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua. But then this next generation, it says, which knew not the Lord nor his mighty works. Now, they knew about the Lord. They knew about his deeds. They were not uninformed of the events of the Exodus or the crossing of the Red Sea or the crossing of Jordan or the fall of Jericho and the victories in the conquest of Canaan. They'd heard it with their ears. It was not facts that they lacked. In fact, they probably said within themselves with a big yawn, yeah, we've heard all this before. And that third generation was simply a, a lukewarm generation, complacent, they were apathetic uh, about amazing biblical truths that they had heard from their childhood. And they just weren't gripped by those truths. And it's always a sad thing, isn't it, when you see that in Christian families uh, where, uh, you know, great things have happened. The parents have been converted or the grandparents gloriously converted. And the next generation uh, seem to go on with the Lord following in their father's footstep. But then the third generation comes along and they're, everything's handed to them on a plate. They have not had to fight any battles themselves. And there's a com great complacency and an apathy that seems to grip them. And of course, to be complacent in the face of Calvary, uh, what we've been considering in the latter chapters of the Gospel of John, the greatest spiritual event in history, to be complacent with that <laughs> uh, event in view is the greatest insult to God that it's possible to bring. To, to yawn in the, in the presence of the wonders of Calvary is, is certainly very distressing and insulting to God. And also one of Satan's most effective tools is to get lukewarmness to creep in amongst the people of God. Three am amazing factors that stand out about the judge's generation. They were satisfied with the status quo. They, um, 
Joshua, who had begun the initial campaign of the conquest of Canaan, he was a real pioneer, constantly pushing the enemy back. And yet the end of his life, there was still, we read in Joshua 13, 1, still much land yet to be possessed. The generation that followed continued to clear out the Canaanites on a local level. Less pioneer advance, but more local skirmishes. And we're going to see that, particularly in chapter one, the exploits of Judah in their locality, how they're, uh, they're, they're these local skirmishes where they're driving out the Canaanites. But the third generation basically said, why bother? We have all the land we need. The Canaanites are not really that bad, and we can get along with them. And so they, they basically uh, compromised and allowed the Canaanites to dwell amongst them. And they weren't exercised about driving them out. And we see it very clearly uh, in the latter parts of chapter two, two, one. Uh, again, it says, verse, you know, we saw in verse 19, they couldn't drive out the inhabitants so on and so forth. Verse 21, the children of Benjamin didn't drive out. And so they, they just learned to live uh, with the Canaanites amongst them. And they began to accept it. And, and they, there was a lack of aggressiveness in pursuing the great commission, which had been given to them and to their generations, which was to expel the Canaanites and take the land for God. And they just settled down and went through the motions and lost that tremendous aggression that had been seen in the former generation. They took the blessings of God for granted and didn't really acknowledge them. They'd been handed this land flowing with milk and honey, and it had been given them on a plate, and they didn't really appreciate their inheritance and their heritage that had been handed to them. And that's a, a great tragedy, isn't it? When you try to give an inheritance to your children and your children's children, a spiritual inheritance, you've paid a price, you've bought the truth, you sold it not, you, you valued it, and, and you've tried to pass on that inheritance, and yet uh, there's, there's really no genuine interest in the following generations uh, to these great things. And they, they just... Uh, well, they're not thankful. They're not even appreciative of what they've been given and the goodness of God and, uh, in giving them this. And then there's a great neglect we're going to see in the book of Judges of the word of God. Joshua, if you go back to the beginning of the book of Joshua, you want to see how much the word of God was valued uh, and was essential really to their uh, kind of victories that they enjoyed. Uh, Joshua 1, verse 7 and 8, it says, Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. And so clearly, the, the book of Joshua, there's, there's a great love for the word of God. There's a, they, they see that their obedience to the word of God and their success are intimately related. And it's wonderful to see this. But when you get to the book of Judges, the same word that was so precious to Joshua is barely even mentioned throughout the book of Judges. They possess the scriptures, but they chose to ignore them. And so it's good to ask the question, what generation do we mostly resemble? Uh, do, we, do we resemble that first generation, pioneering, passionate, paying a price? I mean, they... They didn't even settle down. They were, they, they were constantly, even the, the two and a half tribes on the other side of Jordan, they, they, they left their homes and they lived uh, basically in the land, but they were, they were in war and conflict and, and battle the whole time. They were pioneers. Or are we like the second generation that is you know, involved in local skirmishes and, and seeing things happen for God, uh, 
or with that third generation. Complacent, a yawn describes us great truths that have been handed down to us, but not appreciated like they really ought to. And there's a sense of we've heard all this stuff before. Maybe some of you are thinking that when we go through the book of Judges, I've heard all this before. Um, so uh, are we giving ourselves to the Great Commission and pouring over the Word of God and giving it a proper time to affect our lives? These are good questions that we need to ask. So the book of Judges, it's not all negative. And I, I want you to see that right at the beginning. Because even though many describe the book of Judges as the dark ages of Israel's history, even in the darkest days, one principle you'll find in the word of God is that God never leaves himself without a witness. And there's always a remnant. And we find here in this marvelous book, men and women of faith, heroes that find their place among the heroes of faith in Hebrews 11. And I'd like us just to look at Hebrews 11 just for a moment, and just to see that even though this was a dark period, God still had his men and women that were raised up. Uh, one woman particularly, Deborah, we'll think about her. But, but God still had uh, a remnant, uh, people that, that uh, loved the, the Lord and, and served him uh, in difficult days. Hebrews eleven thirty two, And what shall I say more, uh, more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also and Sam, Samuel and of the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, so on and so forth. It says in verse 38, of whom the world was not worthy. And so the good news is that even in the darkest times, God still has his people, and God still uh, responds to people of faith. Faith still shines in the brightness, in the dark, dark days of the book of Judges. Many examples of faith brighten the whole scene and the whole surroundings that we're going to look at. And so it's helpful for us to, to not become disheartened by the ruin that is around us, but to be rightly exercised. Uh, maybe God would have us to be uh, the, a rallying uh, standard in this generation, uh, like these judges who were raised up for God. And so it's good to see that even in the midst of it, uh, God still had his people. And we see in chapter 2, verse 16, it says, Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges, which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. And yet they would not hearken to their judges, but they went a-whoring after other gods and bowed themselves unto them. They turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in, obeying the commandments of the Lord, but they did not so. And when the Lord raised them up judges, then the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge, for it repented the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. And it came to pass when the judge was dead, that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and to bow down to them. They cease not from their own doings, nor from their stubborn way. So the Lord raised up judges. And uh, actually, Nehemiah chapter 9 calls these judges uh, saviors, which is kind of an interesting uh, description. Uh, let me just read to you from the book of Nehemiah, chapter 9, and verse 27, I believe it is. It says, verse 27 of Nehemiah 9, Therefore thou deliverest them into the hand of their enemies, who vex them. And in the time of their trouble, when they cried unto thee, Thou heardest them from heaven, 
And according to thy manifold mercies, thou gavest them saviors who save them out of the hand of their enemies. So these judges, we, we, we mustn't think of, uh, you know, kind of the Supreme Court, you know, and uh, uh, people wearing black robes and, and wigs and all this kind of stuff. Uh, they, they were really military leaders for the most part. Yes, there were some that did uh, give uh, judgments on, on issues. Uh, Deborah, uh, she had a place where she judged Israel from, and people came and asked, sought her counsel. And she, but, but generally, uh, they were military leaders and they were saviors. God raised up saviors uh, to deliver them from their enemies. Many Bible students see tremendous parallels between the book of Joshua in the Old Testament and Ephesians in the New. They're quick to point out the emphasis on possessing our possession, possessions or claiming our inheritance. Ephesians is all about the great, uh, the, the great inheritance that has been given to us, and it is to be, be claimed uh, by faith. Well, the, the nation of Israel had also, in the book of Joshua, been given an inheritance, and they had to claim it, and it required faith. And so uh, there were battles, just as there are battles in heavenly places in Ephesians, there were battles uh, taking place in Canaan as well. Uh, warring against the enemies. So if Joshua uh, is like Ephesians, the suggestion is that Judges is like 2 Timothy. Our, in our assembly Bible reading, we're actually going through 2 Timothy right now. And of course, the great theme of 2 Timothy is individual faithfulness during a time of corporate failure. And uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's written... Uh, to Timothy, who's in Ephesus, ironically. Uh, and uh, uh, so the, the, there's failure. All that in Asia uh, have forsaken Paul and Paul's teaching, and there's, there's error come in. And so it's individual faithfulness. And so many see that Judges is like Second Timothy, in individual faithfulness in a time of corporate failure. It's about days of declension ruin and recovery now of course i'm sure you're familiar but we can observe certain cycles in the book of judges uh, many have have seen this this cyclical pattern seven times throughout the book which covers a period of approximately 450 years in israel's history uh, if you look at acts 13 uh, you'll see that paul mentions that uh, as the time frame that we're looking at for the book of Judges. So let me just read Acts 13 and verse 20, where Paul makes this statement. Uh, and, and he says, And after that he gave unto them judges about the space of 450 years until Samuel the prophet. So a 450-year period, and during this period, God gave them judges. And th there's, there's certain cycles that, that some have seen seven cycles that go through the book. And the cycle goes like this. It begins with sin, departure from God. And that sin leads to servitude. The people become in bondage, basically, to the enemies uh, in the land. Sin servitude and in their servitude they cry out to the lord in supplication and then the result of their supplication is salvation god sends them saviors or deliverers now let me just show you where this cycle is most clearly seen uh, the seven cycles, but here's one that just stands out very clearly, and that's in Judges chapter 6 and the story of Gideon. So we'll notice the sin part. Verse 1, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and then the servitude part, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Midianites seven years. So sin, servitude, and then supplication. Look at verse 6. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto 
the Lord. So there's the supplication. Sin leads to servitude, leads to supplication, which leads to salvation. Notice verse 11. And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under the oak, which was in Ophrah, that pertains to Joash, the Abiezerite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. So we see this pattern clearly in the book of Judges. Sin, servitude, supplication, salvation. And we see it all the way through. And by the way, very practical, isn't it? Because the Lord Jesus said, whoever uh, sins is the slave of sin. And sin is enslaving. And in our slavery, we come to Romans 7 and we cry out to the Lord, O wretched man that I am. Uh, we, we, we cry out in, in supplication. And then the Lord brings deliverance. Uh, the Romans chapter 8, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And so we, we understand this cyclical issue. We understand it personally. We understand it experientially, uh, that sin leads to servitude, leads to supplication, leads to salvation. And we certainly see that. Now, in terms of the number of judges that we're going to be looking at, there are 13 judges. And, uh, of course, according to the law of third, first mention, 13 is the number of rebellion, which is kind of interesting because there's a lot of rebellion in the book of Judges. And so look at Genesis 14, just in to terms of this number 13 being the number connected with rebellion. 14 of Genesis and verse 4 says, 12 years they served Chedraloma, and in the 13th year they rebelled. So 13 connected with rebellion. And so 13 judges. Now, some would argue that they're actually 12 judges. And the reason they would do that, they would say Abimelech, who we will look at in due course, was self-appointed and not raised up by God. But for our purposes, because he's dealt with in the book of Judges, we're going to assume him to be a judge. And he was at least for a while a partial deliverer. And we're going to see 13 judges. And so <clears throat> let me just run through the names of them. Uh, we'll see them in due course. Othniel, Ehud, Shamgar, Tola, Jer, Ibzan, Elon, Abdon, Deborah, Gideon, Abimelech, Jephthah, and Samson. Now, of course, as we went through that list, some of the names are much more familiar to us than others. And of course, some of them, we get a lot more details than we do of others. But again, we want to look at each of them. And we're going to see that there, it's going to be a wonderful illustration of God using the weak and foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Because we look at these people, and they're the most unlikely people. God using a woman, God using someone who was an illegitimate child, God using somebody who is from the smallest tribe and from a poor family. Uh, uh, and uh, so, so we're going to see that, that it's, an, it's going to be a wonderful illustration to us of how God still delights to use the weak and foolish things of this world to confine the wise. So 13 judges, and of course, we know from our study of 1 Samuel, there are two more judges after the book of Judges, and that would be Eli and Samuel, who both judged Israel prior to the monarchy. Now, in terms of outline, the outline is very similar to the Gospel of John. If you remember the Gospel of John, we had a prologue, and then we had the main body of the, the work, and then we had an epilogue. Well, that same pattern is found in the book of Judges. Chapters 1 and 2 is a prologue, an introduction, if you like, to the whole work. And, and the theme, really, of the prologue and introduction is, could be summarized this way, disobedience, Israel turns from God. And we see them failing to follow on, failing to pursue uh, their commission, disobedience to God, turning from God. We see that in the first two chapters. 
Chapter 3 through 16 is the main body of the book. Uh, chapter 3, all the way through chapter 16, and it's to do with discipline, disobedience, and then discipline. The Lord chastens Israel. And of course, we know whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And we'll observe the Lord is the one who hands them over to the people of the land. And a biblical principle is going to be illustrated as we go through this, and that is this. The way of the transgressor is hard. As they give in and uh, become captive to the enemy, their experience is miserable. And, and we're going to see that, that the way of the transgressor is hard. Chapter 17 through 21, the epilogue of the book. Now, the epilogue is not chronological. Uh, actually, some of the incidents occur very early on in the book. But it's, it's very suitable epilogue. It's disorder. Israel sinks into anarchy. And basically, we're going to see uh, both in terms of the religious life of the nation, uh, we're going to see the corruption uh, with Micah, the 10 shekels in a shirt, and all that passage. We're going to see the, the incredible unfaithfulness to God religiously. And then we're going to see immorality illustrated uh, by the tribe of Benjamin, and uh, that horrendous passage uh, where the concubine is used and abused. So disorder, Israel sinks into anarchy. Now, a very interesting comment from Mr. Darby in his wonderful synopsis, and uh, this is what should encourage us. He says, in Judges, we see the miserable state of the nation now become unfaithful. And at the same time, the intervention of the God of mercy in the circumstances into which their unfaithfulness had brought them. These interventions correspond with what are called revivals in the history of the church of God. Let me say that again. These interventions correspond with what are called revivals in the history of of the church of God. And I, I really appreciate that comment from Mr. Darby, because I think if we want to get a very practical lesson out of the book of Judges, it is this, that I think if we're honest, we're generally living in days of departure, uh, days of disorder, days of apathy. And yet, even in the dark days of Judges, there wasn't a nationwide revival but there were revivals in different areas under different judges. And Darby connects this with revivals in the history of the church of God. And of course, one of the things that Book of Judges might help us to do is to cry out to the Lord that he might indeed revive us in these days of departure and declension, that he might raise up uh, godly leaders uh, who will uh, lead the people uh, from defeat to victory, uh, that God might work in our day and in our generation. Another uh, comment before we kind of begin to dive into the actual text itself, I want you to notice in chapter 1, verse 1, we notice this statement. Now, after the death of Joshua, it came to pass, the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, who shall go up for us against the Canaanites first to fight against them? And so there's uh, really a very optimistic beginning. There's a recognition that there's a battle to be fought and there are enemies to be expelled. And they want to lay hold and enjoy their blessings by putting the enemy to flight. So it begins in a very positive way. Now I want you to go to Judges 20, please. Judges 20 and verse 18, where we read very similar language. The children of Israel arose and went up to the house of God and asked counsel of God and said, which of us shall go up first to the battle? Sounds very familiar, doesn't it? But tragically, notice what it says next. It's not against the Canaanites. It's against the children of Benjamin. And the Lord said, Judah shall go up first. Chapter 1, verse 1, 
who shall go up against the Canaanites. Verse 2, the Lord said, Judah shall go up. <laughs> and now, because of de declension and departure, what has happened is, instead of taking the fight to the real enemy, the Canaanites, and fulfilling their commission, they end up taking the fight to the people of God. And there's a battle between God's people, civil war that took, takes place. And what a tragedy. No longer against the enemy, but against their brethren. And so the book of Judges charts the course of events that resulted in such dramatic deterioration. And obviously, there's a serious declension between these two incidents. Because the problem with the Canaanites was not primarily a military issue. It was a spiritual problem. Their corrupt religion was destined to undermine the children of Israel's covenant relationship with God. Their worship, their relationship with each other, and God's call to them to be holy would be sidetracked, not by the military might of the Canaanites, but because of their, basically, their spiritual life. And the children of Israel would become enamored with the gods of the Canaanites. And uh, as a result of that, would fall into great defeat. Now, on the positive side, there's a, a kind of a, a phrase that punctuates the book. And uh, often after God raises up a deliverer, you'll read that it's, it will say this, and the land had rest. And it, again, a, a careful observer will find that actually, if you add up the recorded years of rest during the period of the judges, it outnumbered those spent on the servitude and oppression of their enemies. So it's easy for us as we go through judges to tend to think that, you know, it's kind of, it's all battles, it's all fighting, it's all bondage and all the rest of it. But actually the periods of rest outnumber the periods of bondage. So it's good to realize that, that the people, for the most part, uh, th there was more rest than there was bondage. But as we've already observed, uh, these wonderful heroes of faith, they shine the brightest in the darkness. And I think today it's a glorious day of opportunity where we can shine ourselves as lights in a dark, dark world. And it is true, the darker the night, the brighter light appears to be. And so we're living in days like that. And we shouldn't be overcome by the evil. But if there's one lesson in the book of Judges, it's that we should overcome evil with good. And that is really the challenge for us. How are we going to live in our days of declension and departure. Well, we do have a few moments to actually uh, look at the text, and we will do that uh, for just a few minutes in chapter one, and the commencement of the campaign against the Canaanites. Now, again, remember, the people of Israel owned all the land because Joshua had basically broken the back of Canaanite resistance and so they owned the land, but they didn't possess all of it. There were still pockets of resistance. They couldn't enjoy all of it until they had expelled the Canaanites from every inch of the land of Israel. So although they were in the promised land, there were still these pockets of Canaanites that were there as well. And so there was a lot of guerrilla activity, these uh, Canaanites were uh, kind of causing problems for the Israelites and, and disrupting their rest. And in, the same, in a similar way, we could say this, that our salvation is absolutely secure. Jesus won the war and defeated the enemy when he hung on the cross and cried out victoriously, it is finished. But yet there's still a work for us to do in the energy of faith. 
there's still pockets of resistance in our flesh to the complete lordship of Christ in our lives. And so, in a sense, we're in a, we're in a very similar situation. We, we The enemy's defeated, but there, there's these pockets of resistance that we cannot become apathetic about. We must do battle, and we must put the enemy to flight. And so the first aspect is the success of Judah. And I want to just highlight just a few things that, uh, We'll look at it in more detail, Lord willing, next time. But I think these are interesting things. It begins on a very positive note. First of all, it talks about the death of Joshua. Uh, of course, mentioned twice in the prologue here in 1 verse 1. And we already saw it in chapter 2 and verse 8. Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died being 110 years old. And of course, the, the reason for these two mentions is uh, the first one is to do with the death of Joshua himself where the second reference in verses 7 through 10 is to do with not only the death of Joshua himself, but also the death of his contemporaries, those elders that knew Joshua. But have you ever noticed that in the Old Testament, often new beginnings are punctuated by the earthly end of God's servants? So, for instance, Exodus begins with the, with the death of Joseph, right? It, it ends with... Uh, Exodus, Genesis ends with uh, Joseph in a coffin in Egypt, and Exodus marks the new beginning. Death of Joseph, Exodus begins. Joshua begins with the death of Moses. Moses dies, and now Moses, your servant, is dead. Now it's Joshua. Judges begins with the death of Joshua. First Kings begins with the death of David. And so... <laughs> We talk about the Canaanites. We're going to think about them a lot during our study. The term Canaanites is a general designation of the enemies of Israel that inhabited the promised land. But it includes different groups, the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Girgashites, the Hivites. They worshipped Baal, Baal worship, and Baal was a male fertility god. And his female consort was Asherah. And we're going to see that the nation of Israel are going to have a lot of issues with Baal worship. That's going to captivate them. See that when we get to Gideon, we're going to see it throughout the book. It's this religious corruption that's going to have a big effect on them. But just to, just to say this, we're going to we'll just state, make the statement and then we'll close. This chapter begins with unity. Notice it says, after the death of Joshua, it came to pass, the children of Israel asked the Lord. So they unified. The children of Israel are together. They're, it begins with prayer. They're asking the Lord. Uh, they're looking for his guidance, for his direction. What are we to do? Uh, who's to go up? It began with fellowship. Notice Judah, uh, verse 3, said to Simeon, his brother, come up with me into my lot. And so there's, there's a fellowship together. In the battle, and it begins with victory, as we see in verse 4, it says, And Judah went up, and the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand. And as we look at the truth of the early church, we see it began with unity. It began with prayer. They're in one place, of one accord, uh, in one place. They're, they're united together in prayer. It begins with fellowship. There's, there's a great fellowship amongst the people of God. They, they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, breaking of bread, fellowship, prayers. It began with victory, great victories we see in the book of Acts as enemy territory is won for the gospel of the Lord Jesus. And if we want to really see revival, we want to see genuine unity amongst God's people. We want to see genuine heart for prayer amongst the people of God, a consciousness of the need of fellowship together in the conflict and believe in the Lord for victory and deliverance over all our enemies. Anyway, this concludes and hopefully is an encouraging ending to our introduction to the book of Judges. Amen.